section four of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter three madeira sighted misfortunes of commander babacum a ride on shore naval cavalry charge down a hill and overturn some dignitaries of church and state a pleasant visit of apology suddenly ordered to sea an expedition to bring off wash clothes a few days after the storm was over madeira was made to the eastward of it as the frigate sailed on there came in sight a small island called the desertas tom wishing to show that he was wide awake reported a large ship coming round the desertas he was however only laughed at for his supposed ship turned out to be a rock of a needle form rising several hundred feet out of the sea and would have been as higson told him if it had been a ship bigger than the famed mary dunn of diver whose flying jib boom swept the weathercock off calais church steeple while her spanker boom end only just shaved clear of the white cliffs of old england the scenery of madeira as they sailed along its shore was pronounced very grand and beautiful its lofty cliffs rising perpendicularly out of the blue ocean with a fringe of surf at their base and vine-clad mountains towering up into the clear sky beyond them here and there a small bay appearing forming the mouth of a ravine its sides covered with orange groves and dotted with whitewashed cottages and a little church in their midst rounding the southern end of the island the frigate came to an anchor in the bay of funchal the town in a thin line of houses stretching along the shore before them and a wild mountainous region beyond with country houses or quintas scattered over the lower ground and high above it the white church of nosa senora do monte glistening in the sun an important object had attracted captain hemming to madeira it was to ship a couple of casks of its famed wine for the admiral on the jamaica station as well as one for himself and he took the opportunity of fitting a new top-gallant mast a few hours afterwards the tudor came in and dropped her anchor close to the frigate she had evidently suffered severely in the gale her fore-topsail yard was so badly sprung that sail could not be carried on it her mizzen topmast was gone her starboard bulwarks forward stove in one of her boats carried away besides which she had received other damages the sea which had injured her bulwarks had swept along her deck but everything had been secured without doing further harm and fortunately no one had been lost commander babacum at once came on board the plantagenet to pay his respects to captain hemming he was a short stout man with a red face and thick neck betokening a plethoric habit after having been on shore for some years he had been appointed to the tutor through the influence of a relative who had actively supported the ministry in electioneering matters probably never much of a sailor though he might have been as brave as a lion such experience as he possessed being that of days gone by he had an especial horror of all new-fangled notions he laid all the blame of the disasters his ship had met with to the dockyard riggers they don't do things as they used to do that's very clear or i shouldn't have lost my mizzen topmast he exclaimed while pacing the frigate's deck with angry steps i doubt whether in this hole of a place we can get our damages repaired i'll send my carpenters on board so that you may be independent of the natives how long will it take to set you to rights three or four days i should suppose was the answer well i will remain for that time and we will sail together said captain hemming 
it was quickly known on board both ships that they were not to leave for some days and parties were made up to go on shore the next morning and take a ride to the corral and other places of interest a merry set of gun-room officers and midshipmen left the ship soon after breakfast jack and adair with lieutenant jennings leading murray could not go but archy gordon got leave his services as he told his friends not being absolutely required they wisely landed in shore boats thus escaping a drenching from the surf and were hauled up the shingly beach by a number of shouting bawling dark-skinned natives who handed them over to an equally vociferous crowd of muleteers and donkey-boys assembled in readiness with their beasts of high and low degree to carry travellers up the mountain amid the wildest hubbub produced by the shouting wrangling jabbering of the owners of the beasts each man praising the qualities of his own animal as he dragged it to the front the naval party managed to mount those who could secure them on horses the rest on mules donkeys being despised though attempts were made to thrust the midshipmen on them the tall lieutenant of marines had not secured his horse which he chose for its height without a desperate struggle a band of natives rushing on him one had hoisted his right leg across a mule another shoving a donkey's rein into his hands while a third adroitly brought a pony under his left leg while kicking in the air but the owner of the high horse saw that his eye had been fixed on it and being a big fellow came to the rescue and offering his shoulder as a rest enabled the lieutenant to spring clear of the mule and other beasts on to the one he had chosen forward my lads he shouted in triumph as he galloped to the front amid an increased chorus of strange-sounding shrieks and cries the party shouting and laughing themselves almost as loudly as their attendants set forward woo woo sung out all the assembled natives in chorus when the muleteers catching hold of the tails of their respective animals with their left hands began to urge them on by digging into their flanks the points of the short goads held in their right hands ara bura cara cara cavache caval screamed out the native and on went the steeds kicking and clattering through the pebble-paved streets well-nigh sending some of their less experienced riders over their heads and dispersing to the right and left every one they encountered i say we won't be after having these fellows at our heels all the way exclaimed adair of course not said jack it would be a horrid bore be off with ye now cried adair to the natives jack and the rest giving similar orders but the muleteers in the first place did not understand what they said and in the second knew better than to let go as without the usual tail pulling and goading the beasts would not have budged a foot we shall be quit of yer ye spalpeens when we get to the lull cried adair at which the swarthy natives grinned and would have grinned more had they comprehended his remark quickly passing through the town up the steep sides of the mountain they clattered between high stone walls crowned by vines geraniums and numberless flowering plants while orange groves were seen here and there through various openings with pretty quintas nestling amid them and when they turned their heads glimpses were caught of the town and bay and the blue ocean they had not gone far when they met an englishman on horseback who pulling up introduced himself as the merchant about to ship the admiral's wine and invited them to stop at his quinta on their way down from the corral with all the pleasure in life answered adair and will you have the kindness sir to tell these noisy fellows pulling at our horses tails that we can dispense with their company it would be far from a kindness if i did for you would find that your beasts would not move ahead without them said the merchant laughing and directing the arrieros to stop at his house on their return he bade the merry party good morning up and up they went till gerald declared that they should reach the moon if they continued on much longer 
at length they found themselves on the brink of an enormous chasm some thousand feet in depth upwards of two miles in length and half a mile in width while before them a precipitous wall of rocks towered up towards the blue heavens broken into numberless craggy pinnacles amid which the clouds careered rapidly although far below they lay in thin strata unmoved by a breeze grand magnificent and similar exclamations broke from the party they pushed on to the end of the ravine where it almost closes a natural bridge of rocks existing over it to the opposite side another much broader ravine opening out beyond returning by the way they came the party gazed down upon funchal and their ships in the harbour faith they look for all the world like two fleas floating with their legs in the air exclaimed adair this is a mighty big mountain there is no doubt about that their keen appetites and the recollection of the merchant's promised repast made them hurry on their downward way they were not disappointed either in the substantials or in the delicacies oranges and grapes with other fruits and wines provided for their entertainment i am expecting your captains and a few grandees and others to dinner or i would have pressed you to stay said their kind host as he wished them good-bye i hope you will come to-morrow though and remember that my house is at your orders as long as you stay most of the naval heroes had imbibed a sufficient quantity of the merchant's generous liquid to raise their spirits even somewhat above their usual high level and adair took gerald to task for not having refused the last few glasses offered though he declared that he himself was as sober as an archbishop and so faith am i uncle terence cried gerald to prove that same i'll race ye down to the bottom of this hit of a hill and whoever comes in first shall decide the question now off we go wallop a hoo a hoo erin go brog and urging on his steed of which his arario had long since let go as had the others of their animals on descending the mountains away he started adair shouting to him to stop from the fear that he would break his neck followed however at the same headlong speed giving vent in his excitement to the same shout of wallop ahu ahu erengo brog the example was infectious the marine officer even catching it and off set lieutenants and surgeons and midshipmen and clerks as if scampering away from an avalanche to save their lives instead of running a great risk of losing them in vain their attendants shouted to them to stop and went bounding after them the animals kept well together in a dense mass a regular stampedo terence and his nephew keeping the lead to check themselves had they tried it was impossible without the certainty of bringing their steeds to the ground and taking flying leaps over their heads suddenly there appeared before them a palanquin a dignified ecclesiastic seated in it attended by footmen while further on were seen several cavaliers some in military uniforms with a couple of naval cocked hats rising in their midst that instant had the cry of erin go brog escaped from the excited irishman's throat avast haul up for your life boy shouted adair on beholding the spectacle before him starboard your helm or you'll be over the padre gerald did try to pull up with might and main but it was too late his steed stumbled shooting him as from a catapult right on the top not of a humble padre but of a bishop of the holy roman empire when his floundering steed upsetting the leading bearer bishop and midshipman rolled over together the former shouting for help the latter apologizing the matter did not stop here though adair managed to clear the bishop after knocking over one of his lordship's footmen his steed bolted into the midst of the cavaliers behind coming full tilt as ill luck would have it against commander babacombe of the tudor who in spite of his boasted horsemanship was incontinently capsized while before he could recover himself or his companions rescue him down came thundering on them the rest of the hilarious cavalcade several of the riders including tom attempting to rein in their animals were sent flying over the prostrate bishop among the foremost ranks of the party ascending the mountain while the rest dashing on 
overthrew the military governor and several other personages of distinction till jack who had from the first reined in his steed and was behind the rest could see nothing but a confused mass of kicking legs and cocked hats and naval caps and here and there heads and backs and arms with a shaven crown in their midst blocking up the narrow roadway shouts cries shrieks and execrations issuing from among them the liberated horses had dashed on leaving their riders to their fate this contributed considerably to lessen the difficulties of the case the drivers coming up jack dismounted and giving his horse to one of them ran to assist the bishop and his fallen friends the midshipmen quickly picked themselves up very much frightened at what they had done but not a bit the worse for their tumble the ecclesiastic was next placed on his legs with robes somewhat rumpled but happily without contusions or bones broken though dreadfully alarmed and inclined to be somewhat angry at the indignity he had suffered jack endeavoured to apologise with the few words of portuguese he could command tom and gerald assisting him to the best of their power though their united vocabulary failed to convey their sentiments meantime the dismounted cavaliers behind had regained their saddles as had the gun-room officers and young gentlemen who had tilted against them their feet lieutenant jennings and terence had scraped clear without losing their seats but nearly all the rest had been unhorsed commander babacombe was the only one who had suffered damage and he had received a bloody nose by a blow from his horse's head but he was infinitely the most irate it is a disgrace to the service that such things should be allowed he exclaimed captain hemming i shall demand a court-martial on your officers or an ample apology mine know how to respect their commander at that moment his eye fell on his own purser and surgeon with two or three others who were trying to get by close to the wall on either side ah i see they shall hear more about it they may depend on that lieutenant adair will be ready to make you an ample apology i can answer for that and you know that naval officers are not always the best of horsemen of which we have just had an example said captain hemming who though annoyed at what had happened wished to soothe the feelings of the angry commander the portuguese officers ascertaining that the bishop was unhurt took their own overthrow very coolly it's the way of those young english naval officers they observed with a shrug of the shoulders paciencia with bows and further apologies the two parties separated the one to partake of the banquet prepared for them the other to make the best of their way into the town uncle terence you bait me i'll acknowledge but if it hadn't been for the fat bishop i'd have won exclaimed gerald as they met adair not very comfortable in his mind coming back to look for them we shall all get into a precious row ye young spalpeen in consequence of your freak answered adair why didn't you pull up at once when i told you pull up was it ye say uncle terence cried the irrepressible young irish boy faith now that's a good joke didn't i pull till i thought my arms would be after coming off but my baste pulled a mighty dale harder really that nephew of mine will be getting into serious difficulties if he does not learn to restrain the exuberance of his spirits said terence quite seriously to jack as they rode on together when i was a youngster i never went as far as he does as to that we are apt to forget what we were and what we did in the days of our boyhood answered jack laughing heartily you certainly had a wonderful aptitude for getting out of scrapes when you had tumbled into them however as it is wiser to keep clear of them altogether you will do well to give your nephew a lecture on the subject and i hope that he will benefit by it i intend to bestow some good advice on tom on the subject many a promising lad injures his future prospects by thoughtlessness though we were not always as wise as solomon we were invariably sober fellows or we should probably have come to grief like so many others we have known faith yes it was that last magnum of madeira floored the bishop and commander babacombe no doubt about it observed adair with a twinkle in his eye by this time they had reached the beach 
when the arreros having claimed their horses not forgetting a liberal payment for their use the party returned in shore boats to the ships the next morning commander babacum's anger was somewhat cooled down though to vindicate his outraged dignity as he could not punish the plantagenet's midshipmen he stopped all leave from the tutor captain hemming considering that the matter should not be altogether overlooked took tom and gerald on shore to apologize to the bishop who instead of being angry laughed heartily and gave them a basket full of sweet cakes and fruit for which though it was a gentle hint that he looked upon them as children they were very much obliged to him and voted him a first-rate old fellow when the midshipmen of the tutor heard of it they wanted to go and apologize also but as none of them unfortunately had tumbled over his lordship they could not find a sufficient excuse for paying him a visit and though they sent a deputation on board the plantagenet to put in a claim for a share old higson declined to entertain it captain hemming afterwards went on board the tutor and having told commander babacum of the kind way the bishop had behaved suggested that it was more christian-like to forgive than revenge an insult even if premeditated while that of which he complained certainly was not and finally induced him to promise that he would say no more about the matter the repairs of the tutor were nearly completed a man-of-war steamer coming in from the eastward reported the signal midshipman to mr cherry she has made her number the pluto he shortly added the pluto's huge paddle wheels soon brought her into the bay when the lieutenant commanding her came on board the plantagenet with dispatches for captain hemming it was thought possible that we might catch you here as we have had a good deal of calm weather and our wheels carry us along rather faster than your sails under such circumstances observed the lieutenant who knew that his tea-kettle was held in no great respect ah yes steam is useful for dispatch boats answered the captain in a slightly sarcastic tone as he opened the dispatches he was to direct the plantagenet and tudor to proceed without delay to trinidad and thence to go on to jamaica calling at the larger caribbean islands belonging to great britain on their way there was an idea that the blacks were in an unsettled state of mind and that the appearance of a couple of men of war would tend to keep them in order instantly the news became known there was a general bustle on board the frigate washed clothes had to be got off and fresh provisions obtained she was to sail at daylight the next morning and the tutor was to follow as soon as ready what are we to do for our washed clothes exclaimed higson mother lobo wasn't to bring them on board till to-morrow evening and if we send to her the chances are she doesn't get the message or doesn't understand it if she does sure the best thing will be to go for them then exclaimed gerald does any one know where she lives well thought of youngster said higson i know where she hangs out to the west of the town beyond the old convent some way up the hill but as i can't make her understand a word i say even if i was to go there i should not much forward matters but i can talk portuguese like a native exclaimed norris a midshipman who had been on board a ship stationed at lisbon for several months and who professing to be a great linguist was always ready to act as interpreter whether he understood the replies of the natives or not he never failed to translate them it was reported of him that once having accompanied the first lieutenant on shore to get a new topmast made he asked the portuguese carpenter at the dockyard in how many days so will you make a new top masto for mio frigato neo intende was the answer not in ten days he says sir reported norris to the lieutenant why we can make one on board in less than half that time lazy rascals we will have nothing to do with them exclaimed the lieutenant his confidence in the midshipman as a linguist unshaken on the present occasion norris's services were however accepted and all in the berth who could get leave agreed to go some of the tutor's midshipmen who were on board the frigate offered to bring on the things if they were not ready no no thank ye answered higson cocking his eye i've a notion that clean linen would be plentiful aboard the corvette and by the time it reached us it would be ready again for the laundress 
he however accepted their offer to accompany the expedition as the wind was light and off shore they got leave to take the jolly boat being able easily to land in her under the guidance of higson they made their way up the hill to sonora lobo's abode a stream ran near it on the banks of which half a dozen women were kneeling battering away fine as well as coarse articles of clothing on some rough granite slabs occasionally rubbing them as a change with might and main on the hard stones singing at the same time as they rubbed or stopping occasionally to laugh and chatter among them was discovered signora lobo or mother lobo as higson designated her battering away harder than anybody at one of his shirts as an example to her handmaidens she rose from her knees twisting tightly the dripping garment not to lose time as she recognized the young gentlemen when norris for a wonder made her comprehend more by signs than words that as the ship was about to sail they must have their clothes immediately a manana to-morrow asked signora lobo no no este nuate to-night answered norris vehemently the washerwoman consulted with her attendants piles of wet linen lay on the ground but a quantity had not yet seen the water after a considerable amount of jabbering and talking it was agreed that the task could be accomplished the sun was hot and the gentlemen must not be very particular about the ironing while one half of the damsel set to work again in the stream the rest headed by the mistress began to hang up the washed articles a young girl being dispatched apparently for further assistance this looked like being in earnest and the dame assured norris that the thing should be ready by ten o'clock how to spend the intermediate time was the question and a ramble into the country was agreed on had they been wise they would have secured some mules or donkeys to convey the clothes to the beach they had however undertaken to carry the bags themselves and were resolved heroically to persevere they set off on their ramble tom and gerald and the other youngsters skylarking as usual they expected to fall in with some venda or wine shop where they could obtain the refreshment they should require before returning and dick needham was sent back with an order for the boat to come for them at the appointed hour after rambling to a considerable distance they began to feel hungry but in vain they searched for a venda fortunately at this juncture they fell in with an englishman on horseback to whom they made their wants known come along with me he answered i will show you a place where you can get some food turning to the right he led them through a gateway along a walk bordered by orange trees myrtles geraniums ever blossoming rose trees and numberless other plants and flowers up to a bungalow style of building from the veranda of which a fine view could be enjoyed over the bay with the town in the distance and the hills on either side this looks like a regular first-class boarding-house we shall have to pay handsomely whispered tom to gerald but never mind we shall enjoy ourselves and i am terribly sharp-set make yourselves at home gentlemen said their guide supper will soon be on the table let's have it as soon as possible that's all and pray tell the landlord that we shall be perfectly content if we can have a few cold fowls and a ham or eggs and bacon and bread and cheese and some bottles of country wine we are in no ways particular exclaimed higson throwing himself on a garden seat and producing his cigar-case will any of you fellows have a smoke when the case was opened but one cigar remained their guide observed it never mind i dare say i can find some in the house he said and soon returned with a box full he offered it round what do they cost asked gerald who indulged in a smoke sometimes when out of adair's sight though his slender purse forbade cigars never mind was the answer it shall be put down in the bill the midshipman took a cigar when a black servant appearing with a dish of charcoal embers it was lighted and pronounced excellent shortly afterwards several ladies came out of the house and entered into conversation with the young officers who took them to be guests staying at the inn the time sped pleasantly by till supper was announced the ladies accompanied them in the oldest taking one end of the table while their guide sat at the other he's mine host after all whispered tom to gerald he knows however how to look after his guests properly 
there might not have been quite as many cold chickens on the table as higson would have desired but ample amends was made by the variety of other good things and the abundance of fruit cakes and wine capital madeira this of yours landlord haven't tasted better anywhere in the island exclaimed higson smacking his lips i'll trouble you to pass the bottle i am glad you approve of it sir said mine host doing as he was requested there are several other qualities but i always put the best before my guests altogether the young gentlemen enjoyed themselves particularly and talked and laughed away with unrestrained freedom to the ladies who seemed highly amused by them and insisted on filling the pockets of the younger midshipmen with cakes and fruit to take to their messmates on board it's myself could manage better with a handkerchief exclaimed patty desmond producing a good big one the hint was taken and some of the oldsters pulling out theirs got them filled likewise supposing that it was the custom of the country for the guests to carry off the remains of a feast coffee was brought in and a stroll through the grounds was then proposed the object of the young gentleman's visit to the shore came out in the course of the evening you must stay here then till the time you have appointed and i will show you a much shorter cut to the shore than by the high road said mine host higson gladly accepted his offer tea and further refreshments were found on the table on their return from the garden and then one of the younger ladies went to the piano and another took a harp and a third a guitar and the young officers who could sing were asked to do so which of course they did patty desmond especially having a capital voice thus the evening passed pleasantly away till it was nearly ten o'clock i had no idea there were such capital houses of public entertainment as yours in the island said higson highly pleased with mine host who had been very attentive to him whatever englishmen undertake however they always beat the natives hollow and now just tell me what's to pay i am amply repaid by having had the pleasure of entertaining you answered mine host laughing i must not let you go away under a mistake the ladies you have seen are my mother and wife and our sisters and two cousins staying with us you may have heard my name as one of the principal shippers from the island and when you come across my brand in the old country you will be able to say a good word for it that i will sir but i must beg ten thousand pardons for my stupidity and that of my shipmates we ought to have found you out at first couldn't understand it i confess mr soon said higson and the rest at their ease and thanks and farewells being uttered under the guidance of the former they commenced their journey through orange groves and vineyards down the hill signora lobo's washing establishment was soon reached and there stood before her house a long line of bags and bundles the former containing clothes the latter tablecloths sheets and towels each weighing twenty or thirty pounds as time would be lost by sending to the boat for men the young gentlemen agreed to carry their property between them their new friend at once declared his intention of assisting how to fist the bundles was the question one could be easily carried on the back but on counting them it was found that each person must carry two after due discussion it was decided that the only way to do this was to fasten the bags or bundles two and two together by the strings of the bags or the corners of the bundles and to sling them thus over their shoulders one hanging before and one behind the two younger midshipmen got the lightest for their share old higson manfully taking the largest and saying that he would bring up the rear their new friend led to show them the way there was a high gate near the bottom of the path but that was sure to be open off started the strange procession amid shouts of laughter to which Signora lobo and her handmaidens added their share adios adios signores they shrieked clapping their hands and bending almost double in their ecstasies the shouts of the merry damsels could be heard long after they had been lost to sight as the not less jovial young gentleman descended the hill at first the path was tolerably even but gradually it became steeper and steeper and the bundles seemed to grow heavier and heavier and the night darker and darker they could see that they were passing through a vineyard formed on terraces built upon the hillside 
the assistant surgeon who followed next their friend had slackened his speed allowing the latter to get ahead of him suddenly the medico lost sight of his guide when stumbling he let his bag slip off his shoulders and was obliged to stop a minute to adjust them bringing everybody else behind him to a halt then to make up for lost time he pushed on at greater speed than before he heard their guide cry out something but what it was he could not tell make haste you in the rear he exclaimed but scarcely were the words out of his mouth than he found himself going head foremost from the top of a high wall when he began to roll over and over down a steep declivity he was not alone for one after the other came his companions the darkness preventing those behind from discovering what had happened higson being the last till the whole party were rolling away down the hill struggling and kicking with the bags round their necks some well now strangled by the cords which held them together ah oh, it's kilt i'm em entirely exclaimed patty desmond who was the first to find his voice where are we after going to is the say below us does any one know can't some of you fellows ahead stop yourselves sung out higson who came thundering along with his big bundles about his neck but the ground had just been cleared not a root or branch offered a hold fast and his weight giving a fresh impetus to the rest away they all went again over another terrace wall shrieks and shouts and groans proceeding from those whose throats were not too tightly pressed by the cords to allow them utterance their cries quickly brought their friend to their assistance when a level spot having fortunately been reached with his aid after some hauling and twisting they were at length got on their legs and their bundles and bags being replaced on their shoulders they proceeded in the same order as before one or two groaned occasionally from the weight of their burdens or from the pain of their bruises but most of the party trudged on laughing heartily at their adventure hello why the gate is locked never knew that before they heard their guide exclaim never mind we can easily climb it saying this he threw his bags over and climbing to the top safely dropped down on the other side the rest of the party with one exception followed his example when higson came to the gate it looked so contemptibly easy that he determined to climb it with his bundles on his back telling tom who was next him to go on he mounted to the top when just as he had got over his foot slipped and down he came having his body on the outer side and his huge bundle still on the inner his neck being held fast by the cord which fastened them together a deep groan escaped him it might have been the last he would ever have uttered but fortunately tom heard it and turning back discovered what had happened help help he shouted here's old higson hanging himself his shout brought the rest to the rescue accompanied by dick needham who had come up from the boat to see after them while a couple of the oldsters climbed to the top of the gate dick raised the old mate with his shoulders after much pulling and hauling his neck was cleared from the noose when he would have fallen to the ground had not dick caught him i'm much afeard mr higson's gone exclaimed dick as he placed his burden gently down dead why he was kicking tremendously just now cried tom much concerned for he had a real regard for his messmate i'm afeard so repeated dick with a sigh let me see said mctavish the assistant surgeon and stooping down he undid higson's handkerchief and rubbed away at his throat feeling carefully round it neck not dislocated as i feared he's all right and will come round presently he said the announcement giving infinite relief to those who stood around as mctavish had predicted hickson soon recovered and as dick was there to carry his bundles the adventurers were once more en route to the boat all hands were warm in their expressions of thanks to their hospitable entertainer you'll not forget mine host of the country venda he said laughing as he shook hands for the last time they gave him three cheers as the boat shoved off and pulled away for the frigate higson had been silent while the rest were talking as if brooding over something at length he exclaimed i say rogers i'll not have you call me old higson they were the last words i heard then you didn't hear me call the other fellows to your assistance answered tom promptly if i hadn't you wouldn't have been sitting up and talking now it wouldn't have been pleasant for your friends to have seen a paragraph in the papers john higson mate of h m s plantagenet was hung on the avast there cried higson i'll break your head you he really was the means of saving your life said mctavish 
then i'm obliged to you rogers and you may call me old higson as often as you like provided you do me an equal service every time the next morning the frigate stood out of the bay of funchal on her way to the west indies end of chapter three section five of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter four the frigate at trinidad magnificent scenery midshipmen on shore purchase a spider monkey and take a ride with him into the country adair meets some relatives he and jack nearly lose their hearts but don't colonel o'regan and his daughter stella a country house visit to a coffee plantation the colonel's schemes the colonel and his daughter embark on board the plantagenet the dragon's mouth the frigate in danger the mists of the early morning hung over the ocean but not with sufficient density to obscure altogether the outline of the land as her majesty's frigate plantagenet was entering the boca navios or ship channel one of the dragon's mouths which lead from the north into the gulf of paria between the island of trinidad and the mainland of south america captain hemming stood speaking trumpet in hand conning the ship the crew were at their stations hands in the chains ever and anon as they hove the lead in deep sonorous voices shouting out the depth of water every one was on the alert for the currents were uncertain and the wind baffling as the sun rose the silvery mist seemed to be drawn up like a curtain exposing a magnificent spectacle islands of fantastic shapes rising from the calm blue water clothed to their summits with mighty trees of varied hues growing out of the crevices of the rocks here lofty cliffs there some deep bay with plantations and cottages beyond or a shady valley the fit abode of peace and contentment as adair who was just then in a sentimental mood observed now in a wilder more open spot were seen the huts of a whaling establishment and then further on open glades and grassy enclosures while on the port side towered up to the clear bright sky the lofty ridge-like mountains of trinidad itself the breeze freshening at length the handsome capital of the island port of spain on the shores of its wide bay opened out to view its broad streets running at right angles to each other and thus allowing every air from the water to blow freely through them on the other side of the town could be seen the savannah a park-like enclosure bordered by pretty villas with a panorama of superb hills clothed with vegetation forming the background of the picture between which extending right across the island was discerned the entrance to the fertile valley of diego martin while across the gulf on the mainland rose the majestic mountains of camana leave was given to all not required on board to go on shore the captain went to call on the governor the officers to amuse themselves according to their respective tastes the talents of norris as interpreter were called into requisition indeed he had a good opportunity of practising his spanish and portuguese as well as french the white population being composed of a mixture of most of the nations of europe the young gentlemen were wandering about as midshipmen are wont to do in a strange town now stopping to buy fruit in the market-place now entering a shop to look for something they did not exactly know what now popping their heads in at a church door when they caught sight of a short broad-faced yellow-skinned carob with a monkey perched on his head one on each shoulder and a fourth nestling in his arm standing at the corner of a street hurrah cried tom here's the chance we have long been wishing for come along norris and try to make the monkey merchant understand that we are ready to treat for one of his happy family 
for combien six penny pieces voulez-vous sell us one of those rum chapsos mon ami said norris with perfect confidence as if expecting an answer though the carib knew no more french than did the midshipman guessing what was wanted he made the three monkeys on his head and shoulders jump down to the ground to exhibit themselves having gone through their performances at a word they sprang back into their former positions the most active being a long-tailed long-armed creature with a body like a lath who had the post of honour on the indian's head that's the fellow for us cried tom clapping his hands i don't think old scrofton will ever acknowledge that he had his origin in such a spider-like animal no but he may be after saying that we are descended from some such creature if he catches us skylarking aloft observed gerald he'll not venture on such an impertinence answered tom i vote we have him though there were some dissentient voices the majority were in favour of the spider monkey a dollar was asked a high price for a monkey considering that hundreds are caught in the woods to be cooked for dinner but then as the carib tried to explain this one was civilised and his education had cost something though he could neither read nor write at present but he might do so if the young gentleman would take the trouble of teaching him the indian's arguments prevailed a dollar was quickly collected tom paying twice as much as any one else that he might have a proportionate interest in the beast and master spider as he was forthwith called became the midshipman's monkey poor master spider he little knew the fate awaiting him now he was theirs the question was what to do with him till they returned on board should they take him with them into the country he would to a certainty be off among his native woods they agreed they modestly requested several shopkeepers in the neighbourhood to take charge of him but all declined the trust they bought however of a saddler a chain and strap to assist in securing their captive at first they were going to put the strap round the monkey's neck but the carib hinted that if they did master spider would be throttled and so it was fastened round his loins he ungratefully giving paddy desmond who performed the operation a severe bite in return ye baste what do ye mane by that exclaimed paddy in a voice which made master spider spring back as far as his chain would allow to the top of a saddle where he sat vehemently jabbering away as if offering a full explanation of his conduct amid the laughter of the rest of the party norris proposed hiring a sitting-room for him at an inn but a somewhat high price being asked for the accommodation it was at length determined to take him with them now that he could not escape each one agreeing to carry him by turns but you fellows are not going to walk about all day i hope i vote we have a ride exclaimed norris the proposal was agreed to six procured steeds rather sorry jades for the sagacious owners having some experience in the way naval officers are apt to ride would not bring out their best horses but the midshipmen did not care about that they tossed up who was first to have charge of spider paddy desmond won and away they started look out that you don't run foul of any of the great dons of the island or lose your way shouted their messmates no fear answered tom we've got spider as a pilot spider did show the way in a vengeance for desmond's horse finding a strange creature clinging to its mane dashed off at headlong speed through the streets and round the savannah followed by the rest shouting and laughing till the foot of the mountains was reached then up they went not by the high road but by a rough pathway which led they did not know where that however was of small consequence it must take them to some place or other and they had little doubt of finding their way back on they pushed scrambling along regardless of the hot sun the dust the flies and other stinging creatures laughing and shouting and belabouring each other's steeds gerald as at first with spider before him bravely keeping the lead they had not been unobserved for lieutenants rogers and adair were riding leisurely along the road round the savannah as they passed at some distance there goes my young hopeful of a nephew exclaimed adair i must look sharper after the lad than i have done when he gets on shore or he'll come to grief 
and my good sister his mother who dotes on him will break her heart i must keep a taut hand on tom too for whom i feel myself responsible observed jack i was glad to have him on board the frigate but i did not reflect on the anxiety he would cause me mercifully providence watches over midshipmen or the race would soon become extinct and there would be no such promising young officers as you and i to be found said adair there go a number more of them happy fellows well it was not so long since we were like them jack the two lieutenants continued their ride bound on a visit which shall be mentioned presently the midshipmen galloped along till their horses knees trembled under them they had left the more cultivated country and entered a wild region the forest closing in on every side birds of gorgeous colours flew by or rose from the thickets beautiful butterflies fluttered in the glades and monkeys gambolled in the trees looking down on them from the branches overhead chattering loudly as they passed we've paid a pretty high price i've a notion for master spider since we might have had a dozen such fellows for the catching observed norris as he watched the monkeys in troops springing from bough to bough but how are we to catch them i should like to know asked tom they can beat any one of us at climbing there's no doubt about that ah well i suppose they can as they are at it all day answered norris sagaciously meantime master spider had been gazing up wistfully at his relations in the trees every now and then answering their chatterings with a peculiar cry when passing under an overhanging bough some three or four feet above him suddenly springing on the horse's head and thence on gerald's in a moment with his long arms extended he had laid tight hold of it while gerald letting go of his rein with equal tenacity grasped the end of the chain fancying that he could haul him back but the arms of the monkey were stronger than his on galloped the horse leaving him as a consequence hanging with one hand to the chain instinctively he made a grasp at the monkey's long tail greatly it is possible to the relief of the owner and there he hung swinging backwards and forwards between the sky and earth the monkey jabbering and shrieking with the pain of the strap round its loins amid a chorus of its relatives while the other midshipmen gathered round laughing till they nearly split their sides without attempting to assist him even tom hard-hearted fellow forgot to help his friend bear a hand some of ye and catch hold of my legs or i'll be carried off by the baste entirely shouted gerald and there's my horse galloped off and i'll have none to ride back on hold fast patty hold fast shouted his messmates it's such fun to see you it's you i want to be holding on to me for if ye won't haul me down the baste of a monkey will be after hauling me up he'll be at the top of the tree in another moment and his friends will be carrying me off among them and i'll never set eyes again on bally mccree shone shone but he turned into a spider-legged monkey i will and poor paddy began to cry with terror as he pictured the fate in store for him at length tom's regard for his friend overcame his love of fun and throwing the reins of his horse to norris he jumped off and catching hold of gerald's legs began hauling away with all his might now though master spider could by his wonderful muscular power manage to support one midshipman the weight of two was more than he could bear and letting go down came gerald and over went tom with the monkey struggling and scratching on the top of them giving a revengeful nip on the most exposed part of his new master's body master spider hadn't long his own way however for the reefers picking themselves up paddy gave him a box on the ears which though it made him show his teeth brought him to order and the tired steed being found feeding close by all hands agreed that unless they wished to be benighted it was about time to return shipward paddy declining the further companionship of spider tom took charge of him and off they set down the mountain side for a wonder reaching the plain without breaking their necks their steeds happily knowing the way better than they did darkness came on while they were still galloping along ah sure our horses hoofs are scattering the sparks all around us cried paddy one of the more knowing of the party however discovered that the sparks were fireflies flitting about above a damp spot through which they were passing 
a good supper at the hotel quickly restored their exhausted spirits and they got safe on board with master spider it was the last ride on shore they enjoyed for many a long day they were soon to be engaged in more stirring and dangerous adventures we must now accompany the two lieutenants on landing having a bill to get cash they repaired for that purpose to the establishment of a certain don antonio gomez who acted as a storekeeper and banker and was they heard one of the leading men in the place he spoke english they found remarkably well are you related to mr adair of ballymacree in ireland he asked on hearing adair's name i am his son was the answer then i am truly delighted to see you my dear sir exclaimed the don my mother is the daughter of an uncle of yours no let me see of a great uncle who settled here some forty years ago or more after the island became a dependency of england she will be charmed to welcome you as a cousin my wife too is irish and we have some guests also who hail from the old country so that you will be perfectly at home you will come up at once and lieutenant rogers will i hope accompany you adair of course said all that could be expected how enchanted he should be to make the acquaintance of his cousin of whom till that moment however he had never heard while jack gladly accepted the invitation offered him while they were speaking don antonio was summoned on a matter of importance i regret that i cannot accompany you at present he said on his return i have therefore written to announce your coming and have ordered horses with a servant to show you the way they will be here presently and in the meantime you must fortify yourselves for the journey with some tiffin he led his visitors to a large airy upper room looking out over the gulf in the centre was a table spread with all sorts of west indian delicacies and wines and spirits and bottled beer a person must go to a hot climate to appreciate the latter liquid properly several persons looked in and took their seats at table as if it was a customary thing some apparently were resident planters others skippers of merchantmen and there were several foreigners who spoke only spanish or french one of the last comers was a fine military-looking man with a handsome countenance a few grey hairs sprinkling his otherwise dark hair and moustache don antonio introduced him to the two lieutenants as colonel o'regan the naval officers rose and bowed and the colonel taking his seat opposite to them at once as a man of the world entered into conversation colonel o'regan has seen a good deal of service in the peninsula and elsewhere observed don antonio to adair knew your uncle major adair and was with sir ralph abercrombie when this island changed masters i must confess very much to its advantage the colonel heard the last remark i was a mere boy at the time having only just joined my regiment he observed with a smile it was not a very hazardous expedition and had there been any fighting the navy would have borne the brunt of it but the gallant spanish admiral apodaca whose memory is not held in the highest repute hereabouts as soon as he saw the british fleet having landed his men set fire to four of his ships and galloped off that he might be the first to convey the intelligence to the governor chacon who was preparing to defend the city from the expected assault he entered at the head of a band of priests piously counting his rosary burnt your ships admiral exclaimed chacon in astonishment then i fear all is lost oh no most noble governor all is not lost i assure you answered the admiral i have saved only think i have saved the image of santiago de compostela the patron of my ships and myself come come you are rather hard on the worthy apodaca his ships were only half manned and admiral harvey would have captured them all after giving him a sound drubbing observed don antonio laughing notwithstanding besides it is a proof that we had pious men among us in those days remember that we had not long before been deprived of the holy inquisition you did not regret its loss i presume said the colonel i saw something of what it must have been in spain when its dungeons were revealed to view as to that i live under the english government and prefer the english system of managing matters answered don antonio but wishing to change the subject he asked what news from the main colonel 
unsatisfactory as usual was the answer something however must be done or the cause will be lost and i am resolved to be no longer influenced by those half-hearted patriots as they call themselves just then the horses were announced you will meet colonel o'regan as he will accompany me by and by said don antonio to the lieutenants they found two richly caparisoned steeds waiting for them with a sable attendant in livery mounted on a third he would have astonished an english groom he wore huge spurs strapped to naked feet a light blue coat richly laced an enormously high hat with a deep band and a flaming red waistcoat he however was evidently satisfied with his own appearance and considered himself a person of no small importance mr pedro padillo showed de way to massa lieutenants he said bowing after they had mounted when say starboard keep to starboard when say larboard keep to port order wise make way ahead thank you pedro you have been at sea i perceive said jack oh yes massa i serve aboard de king's ships and odor craft many years before turn head groom to don antonio answered the black he great man as you shall see presently after rather more than an hour's ride under the steerage of pedro jack and adair reached the country residence of don antonio magnificently situated on the broad shoulder of a mountain which rose clothed with gigantic trees behind it while in front lay the blue gulf dotted over with the tiny sails of canoes a highly cultivated plain stretched out below hillsides and forests plantations and villas appearing on either hand faith my new cousin is well located it baits bally mccree i must confess said adair as they came in front of an extensive bungalow style of building with a broad veranda running along the front and two sides with such a garden as the tropics only can present kept green by a clear stream taught to meander through it and the source of which could be discerned as in a sparkling cascade it rushed down the mountain side amid the trees i am curious to know what sort of person my elder relative will prove not to speak of the younger females of the family added adair as he spoke a cloud of white drapery was seen moving in the veranda it soon resolved itself into a tall dignified old lady another of matronly appearance and a bevy of young ones two or three of them mere girls perfect houri they seemed to adair and jack was much of the same opinion as adair threw himself from his horse the old lady advanced from among the rest holding out both her hands my young cousin i am delighted to greet you it is long long since i set eyes on one of my kindred from the old country and you are welcome doubly welcome as coming direct from dear valley mccree the home of my youth she exclaimed with a very perceptible hibernian accent terence made a suitable reply albeit not much addicted to the utterance of sentimental speeches and then he was introduced to his younger cousins of the second degree and jack who had modestly hung back came forward and went through the same pleasant ceremony one damsel had kept somewhat behind the rest as if she did not claim to be a relation irish to the core thought jack large grey eyes rich brown hair the complexion of the lily tinged with the rose a figure a sylph might envy let me make you known lieutenant rogers and cousin terence to miss o'regan said the old lady the others having retired a few paces thus allowing the officers to advance which they did bowing with admiration depicted in their countenances to the young lady curtsying not very formally she put out her hand and said with a laugh i must beg to be considered among the cousinhood or i shall feel like a stranger in your midst the fair cousins gathered round laughing and said yes yes of course adair took the beautiful little hand so firm and cool and felt very much inclined to press it to his lips but he did not 
the same favour was extended to jack they were soon as much at home as if they had known each other for months donna caterina however as the elder lady was called monopolised her cousin terence naturally eager to hear about bally macree and the various members of his family she charged him to bring up his nephew the next day and hearing that lieutenant rogers had a brother on board insisted that he must come also jack had thus for some time the young ladies to himself which were most worthy of admiration he could not decide they were all so charming but undoubtedly miss o'regan her friends called her stella which sounded more romantic to jack's ears than her surname was perfection or near it a very pleasant afternoon was spent with music and singing conversation and a stroll in the shade under the lofty trees between which the breeze found its way keeping the atmosphere tolerably cool and agreeable jack and terence thought that they should like if not to spend the rest of their days in so delightful a spot to come back to it some time or other but they did not venture to hint at such a thing just then on returning to the house they found that don antonio with colonel o'regan and their own captain had arrived the latter seemed as much struck with stella as they had been and they could not help feeling a little jealous of him though they need not have been so as he paid her no more attention than he did the other young ladies he gave them moreover leave to remain on shore as he intended returning on board and he promised donna caterina to send up her young cousin and tom rogers the next morning several other gentlemen arrived and dinner was announced a magnificent entertainment plate and crystal and sparkling wines in profusion and all sorts of tropical delicacies then came music and dancing chiefly waltzes the young creoles swam through the dances stella moved with more life in her than all of them captain hemming seldom danced he could not resist the temptation altogether but he was engaged for the most of the evening in earnest conversation with colonel o'regan he returned to town in the carriage of one of the guests and soon afterwards the whole party retired to rest as the lieutenants slept within earshot of the colonel they were unable to discuss stella a great privation don antonio was a planter as well as a merchant and he had invited his guests to visit his cocoa plantation of which he was justly proud three or four miles in the interior the midshipmen who had started by daybreak arrived just as the party were setting off they looked somewhat blank when but a slight refreshment only was offered them but were comforted when they found that they were to breakfast on their return gerald was received by donna caterina as a kinsman and he and tom were taken in charge by the younger of the young ladies some of the party went in carriages others stella among them on horseback with terence and jack as her attendants she rode like a thorough irish girl well accustomed to the saddle the party proceeded along picturesque lanes mostly in the shade of umbrageous trees crossing many a brawling brook till they reached on the gentle slope of a hill the confines of a lofty forest with a peculiar undergrowth of shrubs from ten to fifteen feet in height of a delicate green tint these were the cocoa trees and the duty of the more lofty ones whose boughs interlaced by numberless creepers formed a thick roof was to shelter them from the burning rays of the sun a centre road ran through the plantation intersected by numerous cross paths all lined with dark-leaved coffee bushes covered with jessamine blossoms giving forth an exquisite perfume while water in gentle rills conveyed life and fertility to every part the horses were left at the house of the overseer while the party sauntered through the plantation enjoying the grateful shade and the cool breeze which fanned their cheeks how delightful exclaimed jack i am greatly tempted to come on shore and turn cocoa planter what and give up the noble profession to which you belong asked the young lady by his side i should have expected better of you mr rogers 
it was the first time jack had heard stella utter an expression which showed her character while there are wrongs to be righted and the defenceless to be protected i trust that no one engaged in the noble profession of arms will think of sheathing his sword i spoke from the impulse of the moment i really have no intention of leaving the navy which i love as much as any man i am glad of it said stella giving him an approving smile jack who was decidedly matter-of-fact was wondering what wrong stella wished him to redress when their conversation was interrupted and he had no opportunity of asking her till they had mounted their horses and were riding homeward jack at last put the question in all parts of the world answered stella with some little hesitation look to over yonder vast continent she pointed to the blue mountains of kumana seen across the gulf from north to south wrong and oppression reigns even in those states nominally free one set of tyrants have but been superseded by another as regardless of the rights of the people as the first i have not often met young ladies imbued with sentiments such as yours observed jack few young ladies you have met probably have fathers like mine answered stella she stopped as if she was saying too much jack recollected the observations he had heard at don antonio's luncheon-room probably the colonel is engaged in one of the many revolutionary schemes connected with the late spanish south american dependencies he thought his daughter very naturally has faith in the justice of the cause he has espoused yes i confess that i have adopted my father's sentiments said stella as if she had known what was passing in his mind it is but natural for we are all in all to each other my mother is dead and i have no sister or brother he might have enjoyed a well-won rest at home without dishonour but he disdained while possessing health and strength to remain in idleness and i entreated that he would not leave me behind so we came out here some time ago and while he has made excursions on the continent i have mostly resided with our friends here though i have occasionally accompanied him we have made some long trips by sea and i have ridden with him several hundred miles on horseback jack who believed that young ladies were most fitly employed in household affairs or in practising the accomplishments they might have learned with an occasional attendance at a ball or archery meeting thought his fair companion an enthusiast a perfect heroine of romance though he did not tell her so she possibly considered him somewhat dull and phlegmatic jack's notion of duty was to gain as much professional knowledge as possible to obey the orders he might receive and to carry them out to the best of his ability the midshipmen had no reason to complain of the breakfast spread before them on their return to the house meats and sweets and fruits unknown even by name and such coffee and perfectly ambrosial cocoa the young ladies seemed to have nothing to do but to amuse them and perfectly ready they were to be amused in a quiet way though for the heat in the middle of the day was too great for much skylarking don antonio and the other gentlemen had gone into the town but they returned in the evening with captain hemming who invited all the party to take a cruise to the southern end of the island as he wished to visit the pitch lake and the indian settlements and to perform certain official duties the colonel and his daughter and don antonio and his wife with most of the young ladies accepted it and a very delightful trip they had and of course a dance was got up on board which was more interesting to the fair damsels and the naval officers than any of the natural curiosities the island could afford it was whispered in the gun-room that they were to have some of their visitors on board for a much longer time and it at last came out that the captain had promised a passage to colonel o'regan and his daughter to jamaica adair and gerald rode out to wish their cousins good-bye the old lady was as cordial as ever and all of them made much of the midshipmen but terence had a slight suspicion that the younger ones were somewhat piqued that he and jack had not laid their hearts at their feet they were very pretty charming girls he acknowledged and he was not certain what might have happened had he remained longer perhaps they were just a little jealous of stella 
he thought so when his sweet cousin maria whispered no one will deny that she is very beautiful but she is cold as the snow and chimborazo and it is said that while playing havoc with the affections of her admirers she leaves them to their fate with the most callous indifference jack rogers thinks very differently of her remarked adair he says that she is one of the most enthusiastic creatures he has ever met but still i don't know that he can exactly make her out no one can answered maria she seems very affectionate to us and grateful for the attention we have been able to show her and yet we do not know her better now than we did at first just then the subject of their conversation approached and directly afterwards jack and his brother rode up to pay a short farewell visit and to escort stella to the town where her father was waiting for her to go on board the frigate the bustle of preparation prevented any further conversation donna caterina assured terence that he might rely on being welcomed as a relative should he return to trinidad and was equally civil to jack when in his usual hearty way he wished his friends good-bye he was watched narrowly as he handed stella into the carriage but the keenest eyes could not detect anything in his manner beyond the ordinary respect due to a lady the captain had come to the landing-place to escort his guests on board the frigate they reached her side just as the sunset gun was fired stella gave not the slightest start at the sound but sat as unmoved as her soldier father jack remarked the grace and at the same time the confidence with which she stepped up the accommodation ladder and walked along the deck as if well accustomed to ascending a ship's side i never met a girl better fitted to be a heroine than she is he thought still my sister mary and lucy are of the style i fancy best the young lady was followed by her only attendant a black damsel carrying her dressing-case and other articles which nothing would induce her to commit to the charge of the men who offered to take them missy stella tell me not lose dem she answered with a knowing shake of her head no no tank you stella retired at an early hour to the cabin the captain had fitted up for her with a small one close to it for the faithful polly she wished to be on deck she said to see the ship get under way in the morning she and the colonel were pretty freely discussed in the gun-room and midshipmen's berth all acknowledged that she was handsome but some thought her proud and haughty and others that she was rather slow whilst gerald was of opinion that his cousins beat her hollow in which tom agreed with him heartily much more jolly girls they are said tom how they laughed at spider's antics i only wish we may find a batch of such cousins in every place we go to with as capital a country house terence pronounced her a sphinx perhaps he was biased by the opinion the fair maria had expressed jack did not altogether like to hear her talked about especially by the master and purser or the lieutenant of marines who called her a monstrously fine woman the colonel was fair game no one could make out who he was what brought him out to that part of the world or why the captain was so polite to him perhaps it was for his daughter's sake he was stiff and donnish and had scarcely condescended to speak to any one jack and terence defended him on this point but still he did not appear to have made a favourable impression during the day he had been on board with a leading wind and on the brightest of bright mornings the frigate was standing towards the boca de huevos one of the dragon's mouths which lead out of the gulf of paria into the open ocean everything looked brilliant the ship herself the sea the sky the land the passage seemed broad enough for a dozen ships to sail out abreast between the lofty tree-covered crags which formed the shores of the islands on either side still every precaution was taken the lead was kept going the crew were at their stations stella and her father stood on the deck watching the shore as the ship glided rapidly on lieutenant jennings was the only person at liberty to attend to them and he was doing his best to make himself agreeable but he found after a few attempts that he succeeded better with the colonel than with his daughter grand cliffs those he observed awkward for a ship to run against 
no chance of our doing so however not so certain of that answered the colonel the wind is scant and has fallen the yards were braced sharp up and the quartermaster was keeping the ship as close to the wind as possible why we are almost through the passage a few hundred yards more and we shall be in the open sea remarked the lieutenant without a breeze those few hundred yards will be too much for us said the colonel as he spoke the sails gave a loud flap now they filled and the countenance of the captain brightened now they flapped again and it soon became evident that the frigate was drifting stern first away from the line of the open sea so nearly reached toward the cliffs on the starboard hand driven by a fierce current which set in diagonally from the northward through the passage slowly but certainly she floated back had it been directly through the passage it would not have mattered but having no steerage way she was at the mercy of the current and that was taking her directly towards the cliffs many an eye was turned aloft to the canvas on which their safety depended just then the most cold begrimed steamer would not have been despised the captain gave the order for all the boats to be got ready for lowering still he had hopes that the breeze would again freshen but he could not hide from himself the danger the ship was in all the boats towing ahead could not stem that fierce current ever and anon too the swell from the sea came rolling in smooth as glass setting the ship towards the rocks not the faintest zephyr filled even the royals even should her head be got round to the southward she would still be drifted bodily to destruction stella clearly comprehended the danger and watched with admiration the cool and calm bearing of the officers a cable was ranged for letting go as a last resource but the depth of water where they then were precluded any hope of an anchor holding nearer and nearer the ship drew to the towering cliffs lower the boats cried the captain their active crews sprang into them and tow-ropes being passed they began to pull as english seamen are wont to pull against the hot current but all their efforts seemed of no avail in retarding the sternward progress of the frigate it appeared at length as if in another minute her spanker boom would be driven against the cliffs while the outer branches of the tall trees which towered on their summit seemed almost to hang over the mast heads smooth as was the water an angry surf broke against the rocks at the foot of the cliffs too clearly indicating what must be the fate of the proud frigate should she drive against them the lead kept going showed the depth of water still to be great suddenly the ship seemed to be brought to a standstill the lead line remained up and down the hand in the chains announced the fact it was evident that she had got into dead water but she still felt the influence of the rollers for although the boat's crews pulled as hard as ever they could not move her ahead it would be impossible for them also to continue their exertions much longer while but a slight puff of wind from the opposite shore would hasten her fate well i never thought there could be danger in smooth water and a calm and the land close to us said tom who observed the anxious faces of those around him there are many things not dreamed of in your philosophy youngster which you will learn in time answered higson before many minutes are over we may chance to have the mass come tumbling about our ears and i would advise you and the rest not wanted on deck to get below out of the way in good time what you don't mean to say that the ship is likely to be wrecked said tom ay but i do if one of two things don't happen answered higson let's hope that the anchor may hold or that a breeze may come from off the cliffs aboard of us let go sang out the captain all gone shouted adair from forward at that moment master spider having managed to get clear of his chain seeing the green trees so near him was off up the rigging with the evident intention of having a ramble among them tom and gerald caught sight of their new pet at the same moment and forgetting danger or discipline up the shrouds they sprang in chase might as well try to catch grease lightning as that long-armed beast observed higson who did not however attempt to stop them 
spider quickly reached the main topsail yard arm but finding that the tempting trees were still utterly beyond his reach up the topping lift he swarmed and in another instant was on the royal yard thither the midshipmen followed but spider showed an inclination to defend his position and sat grinning at them from the end of the yard round which his prehensile tail was firmly curled he had an advantage they did not possess being able to hold on tightly and yet have both his hands at liberty as tom who led the way put out his hand to catch the creature he received so severe a bite that he almost let go still he was not to be defeated by a monkey the two midshipmen now getting out their handkerchiefs formed nooses in which they hoped to catch master spider's paws and advanced together forgetting that snake-like tail of his with which he could keep at anchor let them haul ever so hard apparently however not liking their threatening front before they could seize him he made a spring over their heads and was in an instant calmly seated on the main truck they were about to follow when jack catching sight of them called them down instantly what all three of us sir asked gerald unable to resist the joke which set the men grinning fore and aft in spite of the perilous position of the ship no the two biggest of you let the smaller monkey take his own time to come down answered jack tom and gerald descended looking rather foolish and the former had to go to the doctor to have his finger dressed for a spider had given it a severe nip the lee line betokened fifty fathoms where the frigate had cast anchor the sails hung in the brails captain hemming was on the watch for the slightest flaw of wind which might enable him to get out of his dangerous position the boats were still kept ahead the rest of the crew were at their stations the marines and idlers ready to pull and haul it was a time of breathless anxiety no one could tell what might next happen spider might have fancied that the eyes turned aloft were directed at him instead of towards the sluggish royals wistfully he gazed at the green branches but he was too wise a monkey to suppose that he could reach them still with his tail curled under it he sat on the truck as comfortably posted as he could desire scarcely a word was uttered only occasionally stella and her father exchanged observations the colonel seemed positively to enjoy the anxiety ah now we have an example of what strict discipline can accomplish he said spaniards or frenchmen would have given way to despair and lost their ship these fine fellows will save theirs though they would have been wiser to have taken the wider passage would that i had a thousand or two of such there might be better hope for the regeneration of south america you will succeed in spite of all difficulties said stella looking up into her father's face with a proud fond glance you will conquer them ten twenty minutes went slowly by the bright sun beating down fiercely on deck and on the heads of the people in the boats till they felt as if their brains were frying mr cherry sent the dinghy ahead with a breaker of water to them it was drained to the last drop suddenly the royals were seen slowly to bulge out the top-gallant sails followed their example let fall sheet home cried the captain and on the word the whole crew were set in motion those on deck tramping along at headlong speed with the sheets in their hands slipped the cable starboard the helm were the next orders adair shouted to those in the boats to pull ahead the chain ran out as the ship slowly gathered way with her head across the channel and she began to move off from the threatening cliffs in the course of a few minutes she had gained the centre of the passage when steering south she re-entered the gulf and came to anchor here she remained the boats having been sent to recover the anchor till a favourable breeze carried her through the boca de navios and clear away from the land End of section five.